I've started 11 companies. I've had three that were public. We've raised millions of dollars. And so my perspective when blockchain came around was a little bit different. And we did actually do, I don't even call it an ICO, we did a token round at the event Anu was speaking at in, this, in February in Silicon Valley. We actually won. We took first place against 400 companies, 31 presented. And that, that sort of started this ball rolling. But in my opinion, the ICOs were always, a, they just don't make sense. And I love the space. But to me, they didn't make sense, and I thought, long term, this isn't going to work. And I really had some challenges with it, so I created something called a Toquity, and we didn't know quite what to do with it. Um, there's no way to patent it. I'm not trying to make money on it. This was about making the industry better. Because what I realized is more money needs to come in, and it's really that structured capital that's going to have to come in. And so what I'm going to talk about is something I created called a Toquity. If it works, this may end up like the SAFT, for those of you that have been in the space, cooling is credited with creating stuff called the SAFT, the future token. Um, but I'm just gonna fly through a couple things. Before I do though, I'm a big, big proponent of distinctions. People all the time are like, oh, are you in cryptocurrency? I go, well, what does that mean? Well, are you in blockchain, are you crypto? And, and, and I, I fought with people, John Nigerian's a buddy of mine, I wouldn't let him invest in our company unless he changed the way he presented cryptocurrency on the news. I said, to me, there are very few cryptocurrencies. Very few things are trying to actually be a currency. Bitcoin, Dash, Zcash, those are the ones that maybe one day you might be able to use to buy something. Most of the other things are what I call crypto coins. To me, they were more like glorified penny stocks. They're more like something you trade. Ripple XRP isn't really a currency, it's a coin or a token that you could trade and make money on. Cardano, Tron, Terra, these are all coins on top of a platform. So I started building a distinction between currency and coins to help people understand the perspective of investing a little bit differently. When you look at things, you should look at it as, do I like the company, do I like the management, or do I think I don't make money? Not will it be a currency, because that to me just long term doesn't make sense. And I do that by, by gold, and this used to roll up in animation, so everybody I'm going to tell you not to look at the top right-hand corner. The first thing you're going to do is look at the top right-hand corner, so it doesn't work very well. But if I were to ask you how much is a gold bar, how many people know how much a bar of gold costs? Well, now you do. I didn't. I had no idea. Fascinating to me. I compare Bitcoin to a glorified <laughs> gift card. Bless you. A bar of gold is $506,000, 514. It kind of goes up and down like a Bitcoin. But what made gold unique to me is it's finite, it's rare, but if I can't buy a $500,000 gold coin, I mean a gold bar, I can buy a $50 gold coin, I can buy a $250 gold inlet or ingot, that gold coin goes up at the same percentage as the guy that can buy a $500,000 gold bar. So Bitcoin to me has always been sort of this asset of, wow, how does it work because like gold, there's a finite number of Bitcoin that are ever going to be created. How are they mined? I don't know. I don't know how gold is mined any more than I know how Bitcoin's mined. I honestly don't. I have tons of friends in the industry. I don't care. I don't care anymore how gold is mined. I care, can I buy a $50 gold coin and will it go up or down in value? Like to me, technology isn't how it works. It's what it does for me. How does it work for me? How does it work for other people? And so that's how I looked at and Bitcoin was, eh, glorified gift card, meets a penny stock, but it's kind of cool. So we started looking through that, but again, Bitcoin to me, just as a perspective, it's, it's the great equalizer. The democratization of finance. I came out of the finance industry. I spent six and a half years, Travelers Group. I trained 8,000 people in six years, fully licensed broker. I get finance. 90 something percent, I'm not going to use the exact one because anytime you're taped, people can fact check you if you're off by a percentage, they harass you. So 90 something percent of the people in the world have never been given access to financial instruments. If you want to invest in Amazon, you could. An Amazon stock is $1,500. Most people don't have. They're not going to sell you one Amazon stock. You really can't go anywhere and buy one. But Bitcoin... If you want to buy $50, $200, $300 worth, you can. 
If you want to buy a percentage of Ripple or XRP, that to me isn't that fascinating because Ripple at 50 cents isn't any different than a 50 cent penny stock. Like to me, they're investment perspectives. Bitcoin though has this unique parameter because of the finite nature, it could be worth two, three, four hundred thousand dollars. I'm not saying it is, I'm not speculating, but just the mechanics of it to me were interesting because it's an asset like gold that has a finite number. Just like gold, a bar's worth five hundred thousand dollars. There's no reason a Bitcoin can't be because you can buy a percentage. So the guy in Bangladesh that's got fifty dollars and doesn't want to put it in the bank and has never been able to invest can now invest in something like Bitcoin, which will correlate into cryptocurrencies and coins and things like that. So the technology to me was fascinating as a great equalizer. And I looked at crypto coins and ICOs and said, all right, what are they? They're really like to me a glorified penny stock. I'm not trying to downplay it. But you got to create liquidity. You have to get trading. You know, it's it's like a, a, a stuff. And now we've got this new term STO. How many of you know what STO is? A couple. My guess is if you've really been in the industry 60 days ago, the term security token offering, because the question was, are you a utility or security? Utility means we all heard these examples. Oh, you buy something, you can use it like an arcade. You buy it, you can use it like a carnival. Security meant I'm investing in something for the purpose of making money. 60 days ago, that was the definition of a security token. Now, I'm baffled by the industry. Now the definition of a security token is these new people are trying to create security tokens that might give you equity, might give you dividends, might give you some percentage of ownership. That to me is a stock. We're in a screwed up industry where we, as an industry, don't want to be regulated as a security, don't want to be regulated as an investment, but we call the investment thing that's not an investment a security token, but we're not a security. Like call it a distribution token, call it a, call it something other than what you don't want to be. <laughs> that's where I come from for this industry. I'm like, guys, this is so frustrating. So when I looked around, I said, how do we make this better? What do I like? Why invest in an ICO? Great, a lot of great stuff. Easy access, low dollar amount. You may or may not have to be qualified depending on how it counts. You get faster liquidity. If you're an angel investor, I love this thing. People go, well, if I invest and something goes wrong, I can lose all my money. And I said, welcome to the world of angel investing. Nine out of 10 companies fail. So as an angel investor, that's your risk. But when you look at the underlying tenant, does anybody know the number one reason businesses fail, small businesses, small companies? There's one, there's three or four contributing factors, one primary factor, anybody wanna guess what it is? Money, capital. If you don't get properly funded, if you miss your milestones, if you miss any one of these things, you are screwed because you don't have enough money to get through to be successful. If you're a smart entrepreneur, you're going to figure it out the longer your runway is because you're not trying to screw people. You're trying to be successful. Capital doesn't always follow that same thing. So the ICO is like this great way to get funded and it's quick and it's easy and it provides liquidity for your investors in a way that equity never did. And you think, all right, well, if that's the case, what's wrong with it? There's a lot of problems with ICOs. Number one, they are disconnected from reality. And that reality is, for the most part, up until 30 days ago, there was no equity, there is no compliance, there is no guidance, there is no oversight, there is no equity. Equity is fascinating, but equity means a bit of a fallacy. But still, people are like, oh, I want my equity. I want my liquidity but I want some compliance in equity that I've got something that allows me to say or participate or do what I want. <clears throat> and so what we looked at is, this is kind of what we talked about earlier when I said there's no internet before the internet. With the ICOs, with these new platforms, you can raise a lot of money very quickly. You can build a telegram channel, you can build a, a, a signal, you can do things you couldn't do before. If I have five or six or 10,000 people in my Telegram channel, those are like my customers. I can communicate directly. Without internet technology platforms, you could never do this. So I said, how's this gonna work? I use the term I call retrospective evolution. This is the investment structure that I created. 
In my opinion, it's the only way, if not one of the only ways, to allow corporations, venture capital, hedge funds. These companies are set up. A family office, for the most part, legally can't invest in a token or an ICO because their compliance won't allow them. There is no equity. There is no guidance. If you've got a venture capital fund, you can't start a side fund to put into blockchain, especially when blockchains have better returns. Because your limited partners in your existing fund are going, well, wait a minute, why? Like, there were a lot of compliance issues. So what I created, retrospective evolution, is how do you go backwards and look at what works in order to go forward to use the new technologies? And this is what I'm going to show you. Any of you that are in finance will get this really quickly. I'm going to move relatively fast. If it's too fast and you want this information, I'll give it to you. If you want me to slow down, we can do a QA. But I'm going to move quickly because this is more into the, the finance gap. Traditional round of financing. Does anybody actually raise money, venture? I have. Here's, here's about how it works, other than it being a pain in the butt. You go out and you try and raise a million dollars in your friends and family round, and it might take you two, three, six, eight months, depending on how well. They call that a friends and family angel round. Next up, we got a Series A. Company's somewhat successful. You might build a product, have a little traction. Let's say it's a $4 million Series A. That's a year to two in. After that, we now have some customers, we have some revenue, we have some proof points, we're out begging for money again. And now we're into a Series B, might be $10 million at 50 cents. And if all of that goes really well, we're going to roll around in a Series C about three to five years from now as our expansion capital. And it's going to take us three to five years to raise $35 million. And it's going to be time consuming and expensive and a lot of begging and cajoling. It, it's, it's a jumbled mess. But that's the way the world works. ICOs to me are fascinating. Basically, you, you send an email out, you talk to your friends, you say, hey, I'm going to do a private round at 10 cents. It's a million dollars. You better get in. As soon as the 10 cents is done, the next round's at 25. If you miss out on 10, the next 25. And if you miss the 25, as soon as I feel that, my next round is 50 cents. You better get in quick. And then my last round's going to be you know, 10 million at 50 cents, and I'm gonna do 20 at 75 right before I go into my public ICO. If you don't get in, you're gonna miss it. Traditional financing on the left, you don't know what that next round of valuation is. You don't know what your next round of capital is. If you run out of any one of those points and miss that mark, your company's screwed. The ICOs, you can raise money in three to five months in the old days, which was three months ago, like the markets changed, but you could raise in three to five months or sometimes 35 minutes. And I was fascinated, like how do you raise money in 35 minutes? Ah, you use technologies that the internet enabled you to do that you couldn't do before. For instance, let's build a Telegram channel and get 5,000 people in there. And when we're ready to go to market, we have customers. That to me is a direct public offering. If I could do that in the stock world, this would be great but you can't because of regulation. So how do you marry these two together? That's what I created called a tokeny. These are the three parts of the investment strategy. And I'm gonna cover each of them, but, but for top line, it's equity, token writer, and a public ICO. And here's what I mean by this. Number one, everybody likes equity. How many people want equity? Yeah, we love equity, all right. There's some pros to equity. It's a long-term value compliance, whether it's a preferred, or there's a bunch of things with traditional equity that we could negotiate. And it has a lot of advantages. It also has some structural disadvantages. If you really think about it, the con, there is no liquidity in your equity as a private company. You don't really own anything. We think we own it because we've got a stock certificate, but do we really know? If the company goes under, we don't get anything if, unless we're an accredited investor at the front end of the credit, which are the guys who loan the money, not invested. Like, we don't really own anything, but we've been conditioned to think, oh, we own a piece of that company. We own a distribution of that company. And then if we do hold it, it's 6, 9, 10, 12 years before you get liquidity. And you're compressed and diluted at every round along the way. But equity's great. We want equity. So I created it where I'm going to show you how it works. Step one in the token round, we're going to give them equity. Then step two, we're going to create something called a token writer. Now this is critical. How many of you know what a warrant is? Warrant coverage basically says if you give me a million dollars in my company at 
50 cents for the equity, I'll give you warrants at 50 cents, which means at some point in the future, if the company is successful, you can buy those warrants at 50 cents. But the way a warrant is structured is it's not a legal investment. There is no taxes. You don't really own anything. You own the right at some point in the future. And that to me, retrospective evolution, I said, let's create a token right or not even a token option because an option connotates a investment. Warren is a investment and we're not supposed to be investment. You guys kind of get the, the, the industry doesn't know what they're doing. So we have to air quote ourselves. But a token writer says, hey, this is similar to a warrant. You grant it at the same price as your equity. And you allow the company to own something without owning it. So the option sits there where all of a sudden I could go to an investor and say, I'm going to give you this token as a coverage, just like a warrant. I don't have to describe to them and teach them what an ICO and a token, like they understand warrants. I said, it's like a warrant, but it's not just by name, but the token writer has some advantages. If you own equity at 50 cents, but you also own options at 50 cents of the token, you potentially, and these are a bunch of big ifs, if that token is successful, and if that company gets listed on an exchange, and if that exchange has liquidity, and if that liquidity demands your product, and if the price happens to go up, those are all a bunch of ifs in the security world or the token world. Like just issuing a token doesn't mean you're on an exchange, doesn't mean anybody cares, doesn't mean the price of what, but if all those things happen and that token's trading at two or three dollars, the token holder can say, aha, I now want to execute that token right. And three things are interesting there. Number one, the owner gets to decide where the token is delivered. Now that's important. I did not deliver a token to that person. They don't own it. There is no alternative minimum tax the IRS might hit us with. So six, nine, 12, 15 months from now, the company can say, oh, based on current legal, current jurisdiction, current compliance, whatever the world, it's like a year from now, I want my token delivered to an SPV, a special purpose vehicle in the Cayman Islands, or Liechtenstein, or Zurich, or Jamaica. The company can decide where that token is delivered based on legal jurisdiction, tax implication, and then decide how to pursue that liquidity. So that equity is a long-term hold, but the token we're calling a liquidity token says you might have liquidity in 6, 9, 12, 15 months versus the equity where you're holding for 6, 9, 12 years. It's kind of the best of both worlds, but by creating this token writer and not delivering it to them, we've removed the liability to allow them to actually invest for equity and own the tokens as an option, and we separated the liability out. Third stage, almost done here. At the end, we're looking to do a public ICO. We probably will do a $20 million public round, which means we will raise money most likely in Malta because we've looked at the international jurisdiction. That $20 million, if the market supports it, and there's a bunch of ifs, but that $20 million, it's additional liquidity for your company. You're able to raise money, but it's non-dilutive. Meaning that $20 million, because it's sold to the public, does not dilute the equity of the shareholder. And the venture guys don't get that. They're like, well, no, if you raise money, you have to get diluted. No. In a traditional world, you get diluted by your BCD round. The structure I created allows you to not suffer dilution. So here's what it looks like in numbers. And this is a little tough. Again, if you follow financing, then it works easy. If I were doing a traditional round, look at that first column on the left. If I was doing a traditional round of funding to raise $10 million, my valuation would probably be 30 million. I'd like it to be 40 or 50. The venture guys like it to be 20, but let's say it's 30 million. I'm gonna raise $10 million on 30 pre, 40 post. I'm gonna give up 30% of my company in equity. What we've done here is we said it's a little different. My valuation, Mr. Investor, for your equity is twice as high. 
It's 50 pre, 60 post. You're only getting 16% equity within the company. But that's your long-term hold. That's your value. That's your compliance. That's your guidance. That's your oversight. That's if the company is successful and sells for a billion dollars at some point. You get your distribution. Step two, remember, is a token option, Mr. Investor. So for that same $10 million, which is the next column to the right, we are going to give you $10 million in optional tokens that if the company is successful, you could sell those tokens to get your liquidity in 6, 9, 12, 15 months. So by giving you another $10 million in optional token writers, we've actually cut your valuation, Mr. Investor, back in half. So you're only getting half of the equity, but you're getting the other half in tokens that give you advanced liquidity if the company's successful. Separate the liability, provide benefit to both, and now their 32% total is between the equity and the tokens, but the tokens give you liquidity. The equity is a long-term fallacy to get out of. And then if you're successful, the third round, as you can see out there, is if we go raise 20 million, and I say we, this is any one of you can structure this same thing with the, the investment dollars. It's just perspective of how we're doing it. If we're successful in raising 20 million, we'll be on that 60 million pre, because now the pre doesn't matter. 80 million post means we've raised $20 million, but it's non-dilutive. So that investor is still at the same 32% total cap, 16 equity, 16 tokens. I looked at this and I went, wait a minute. If I do a public ICO, again, I come from the penny stock world, guys. Any of you that have been in penny stock, most of it is bullshit. It's press releases, it's pump and dump, it's a lot of stuff. But if you do it the right way with fundamentals, corporations, companies, revenue, your announcements can move the stock fundamentally. That's what we looked at there. We're going to look to do a public ICO after we've raised another $10 million. But that $10 million allows us to go to revenue, bring on customers. I'm telling our venture partners, the companies that we're in discussions with, I'm like, look, guys, if we're successful with you as an investor, you can help us raise the 20 million. We, we want you to participate. You want us to be successful raising the 20 because that gives us more capital to try to be successful. It protects their investment. And the goal for you, you should have a better success propensity or, or potential if you could raise money in the public round when you actually have a product, when you have some customers, when you have revenue, some more fundamentals as opposed to the white paper capacity we've been living under for a while. Yeah. So again, to me, I separated it out. The legal structure was, yes, there is equity. We're giving up less as entrepreneurs. You get less as an investor. But we're giving you tokens, which gives you advanced liquidity if it's successful. And then that third round is, can we raise additional capital that's non-dilutive back to the parent? And, and this legal structure, again, we've traveled all around the world. We've looked at all kinds of things. This to me is the cleanest, most efficient way. All of the new security tokens coming out still jumble up because nobody knows what a security is or a token or a dividend or a, like it's just too much of a jumbled mess. And I love the people say, oh, we have an SEC compliant token. I'm like, how when there is no SEC compliance against something that SEC has never done? I didn't want to take that risk. So to me, this was a risk free way. And I love my attorneys in closing. The attorneys are always like, well, you know, what if something happens? What if the investor loses his money? What if he gets sued? Because you're always going to get sued. If you, if you lose money, if you're coming, somebody's going to sue you. In this situation, the worst they could get sued for is being a bad negotiator. Because instead of getting 30% equity, they only got 16. Structurally, everything else is the same. But by removing the token and not delivering it, it allows them to potentially invest in the company, they are not investing in an ICO. It's the biggest thing of what we've done differently. So that's it. Where do I think the future of crypto is going? I, I'm fascinated by it. I love it. I think ICOs are a new type of funding. I believe in the end it'll be sort of like a DPO, a direct public offering. I think there will be compliance and guidance. I'm hoping we're trying to work with some of these guys with Kucinich and Richardson. We're looking to see if we can shift everything under the Jobs Act which is already kind of set up to protect equity and investing and just move the framework over and raise the caps for the investing side. 
But I think the ICOs will work. I just don't think in the structure of a pure token, they don't make sense for both parties. They don't make sense for the investor. They don't make sense for the long-term vision. This to me was an interesting way to do it. So a few things in, in perspective, like I said, retrospective evolution. This was just how can you reframe a way to do investing that I think works for all parties. And this is the only one we've seen around the world. That's it, Tokwiti, Future of ICOs. If you guys have questions, contact me there. If you want the presentation, let me know and I will send it to you. Thank you. Thank you.